uh, it's time but uh, i think we're expecting a few more uh, part, uh, audience members so alex if it's okay with you can we wait say another 2 minutes or so cool perfect Hello, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everyone from India, Uruguay, and across the world, uh, and also to all the chat bots that have joined us. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the 13th DCW Conversation Hour. Uh, this is going to be a really interesting discussion. That's something which I am personally looking forward to learning quite a bit about. Um, so briefly, I'll introduce uh, what DCW is, uh, uh, the movement or the collective that is uh, organizing these uh, conversation hours, and then I'll introduce the event, and then, and then I'll hand over the floor to Alex. So DCW, or the Urban Community Wikimedia, is a recognized but independent affiliate of the Wikimedia Foundation. It focuses on representations of global Muslim academia, history, culture, heritage, and scholarship within Wikimedia projects across all languages. DCW was recognized by Wikimedia Affiliations Committee in January 2022, and it has since then established a range of programs and initiatives in order to achieve its objectives. DCW's major programs include its monthly conversation hour, of which uh, we are running the 13th edition right now. It is open, open for everyone across the world and the Heritage Lens, which aims at capturing Muslim heritage all around the globe and making it available for free. Our volunteers have represented us at several Wikimedia conferences, including the Wiki Conference India 2013, Wikimania Singapore 2023, and Wiki Women's Camp 2023. Moving on to the event, in the 13th DCW Conversation Hour, we are delighted to welcome Alex, 
and we look forward to a deep dive into the Organizer Lab, a program which is being run by the Wikimedia Foundation, which aims at impactful content campaigns and strategies to improve technical and social workflow for organizers in the global Wikimedia movement. The conversation hours, the conversation hour features Alex Stinson, a lead program strategist at the WMF and a long time Wikimedia contributor, voluntarily contributing as an administrator on the English Wikimedia as well. Alex has, Alexander has worked as a project manager for the Wikipedia library and supports Glam Wiki outreach and Wikipedia education programs. He has significantly contributed in establishing a Glam Wiki team at the WMF and has helped develop the research development program for the Wikipedia library. He has a master's degree from Kansas State University, where his research focused on cultural studies and digital humanities. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Thank you so much for everyone who is participating. Uh, Alex has a presentation uh, where he will tell us about the Organizer Lab, and then uh, we'll open the floor for questions and discussions. Uh, in the meanwhile, feel everyone feel free to uh, pour in your thoughts and questions and comments in the chat box as well. Uh, Alex, would you like to take all questions towards the end or would you like uh, back and forth? Whatever you are um, comfortable I'm, with. I'm happy for it to be a conversation. Um, I, I think the Wikimedia movement works best when we clarify and communicate as we go. So, yeah. Perfect, I'm... perfect. <laughs> So everyone, um, uh, pour in your questions in the chat box, and we'll have a separate Q&A later also, but if you have something uh, that you'd like to pop in with in the while the presentation is happening, so feel free to now over to Alex. Hola, hello, is everyone. Um, I'm, I'm calling in this morning from Uruguay, which is on the other end of the world, uh, for, for uh, those of you in India. Um, we're not such a small country, uh, actually, uh, as portrayed on the Mercator uh, projection here. It, it's just the angle of approach um, makes it look small, uh, but we are tiny in terms of population. Uh, it's a small country, and so you might not know about it. Um, I've been in Uruguay for about four years now, um, but I'm originally from the United States, where I was uh, started organizing in the Wikimedia community there. Um, and having been an organizer in different parts of the world, oh, uh, let me, I can change my mic if the sound uh, is not clear. Um, do, 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 do. Mic. Uh, ba, 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 microphone. It's it, is that better? Sound it sounds good to Does me. Does the sound better? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um cool. So that's better from Maribet. So cool. Um so ha having been an organizer in the Wikimedia movement for about a decade and having been at the foundation for about nine a little over nine years, um the organizer lab. Uh, is a project that I'm particularly proud of uh, in the scope of what I've learned as an organizer, but also as someone who's been part of this global community that that is often struggling to do outreach and impactful activities really well. Um, so I'm really happy to introduce you to this. Um, this, the Organizer Lab, it is in its second iteration right now, and we're about to finish it in, in the upcoming month. And I'm going to tell you a little bit I'll start with what is it? Why did we create it that way? Um, and then tell you a little bit about the impact uh, it's having. Um, and then we can talk and ask questions. So why do we need an organizer lab? Uh, the movement strategy process was really clear that we needed to invest in the skills and leadership development of the Wikimedia movement. But we also need to work to kind of fill key topic gaps uh, across Wikimedia projects. These are uh, topics for impact. That is the content we expect to both be usable for, for the public that we have, but also that's strategic, right? That, that allows us to have an impact on the world more than 
Um, as much as we appreciate, say, the random Hollywood movie star uh, page, that may not be as impactful uh, for, for all topics, for the kinds of implications, the impacts we want to have on society. Um, and so thinking about, like, how do we approach those knowledge gaps? And I also did a research project about three or four years ago called the Movement Organizers Research. Uh, this was a set of research that looked into like who are the people who are organizing these events all around the world who's doing these activities who like uh the organizers of the dcw conversation hour or um mervat or whoever else is in this call like you've run an edit-a-thon a campaign who are these people what do they need and something that became really really clear in the research and has been subsequently kind of verified in a couple different ways uh, by by the way we evaluate organizing is that there's basically two kinds of organizer in the Wikimedia movement. There's the local event organizers who are you know doing the work down on the ground, running small events, training a lot of people. Um, and this is often where people start their career as a Wikimedia organizer. It's like I can run an event. This is really easy to do. I can go run art and feminism or Wiki Loves Monuments or whatever activity. And then there's the meta organizers who coordinate all of that activity, right? They they kind of create the social infrastructure so that a campaign like Wiki Loves Monuments um, or Wiki Loves Folklore works, right? They're the people who have these kind of weird cross-cultural skills. They're often multilingual. They work in a lot of different ways. Um, but something you notice when you talk to both of those groups is that the meta organizers are constantly looking for the replace volunteer replacements for their role, because as a volunteer doing this coordination work is really hard. And the local event organizers are kind of getting frustrated with those local events and those local activities because they're like, I'm not sure if it's having the impact I have. The mission of the Wikimedia movement is so much bigger than it is like, than the thing I can do with this like 20 person event on the ground, right? And so we're trying to create a space with this training that kind of meets them in the middle meets people in that transition from local organizer to meta organizer and helps them think strategically about how do we take this experience we have of running local events and kind of turn it into something that can be more strategic and work across multiple communities and fill those content gaps. Um, and so I'm wondering, as I'm talking about like these different types of organizer, it, either in the chat or if you want to raise your hand, like have you ever run an event in your community that didn't work? Uh, and if you share an example of that and why it didn't work, um, I'd love for you to, to do that. <laughs> yeah, Zico, what, what didn't work? <laughs> I, I, I can talk about one, uh, of mine while folks kind of get bold enough or write their example. So I was when I was in my master's degree in Kansas State University, I saw a like decolonizing Wikipedia series of events that had worked really well in other uh, universities. And I was like, I'll do one of those. And so I asked the department that I was part of to give me like two hundred dollars for like food and like snacks or one hundred and fifty dollars or something. I was like, I'm going to make this great. And I put flyers all over the university and two people arrived. Um, and so uh, raise your hand if you want to share an example um, and we'll work. And so for me, that that event was like a, a, a terrible, terrible moment uh, because I was like, I'm this like really good trainer. I didn't know all these things, but I have no idea how to get people at my university involved in this. Um, and it was really terrifying for me. That was the first event that had happened to me like that. I'd been running events for years, but this one was like particularly shocking to me. Um, so can we either unmute someone like Zico? Uh, yes, just Maybe Afi, can you, uh, can you take care of that? I don't think I have the permission to. Ah, now it works. Oh, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Yes. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, I, I uh, it, it was my problem. So once, once uh, I organized an event for which I had invited experts to uh, to share skills with community members, and the problem was that our, that many from our community members they were not really invested in learning the skill. They were m much more joining the event to meet each other and have fun and make jokes and interrupt the expert uh, every third second, every th sentence for 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 anything. And uh, so it wasn't really useful at the end. And uh, yes, uh, if the majority of the participants are not really there in order to do what is the goal of the convention, then it's uh, a little bit difficult. Yeah, that's a great example of like you got people to show up, but the actual program didn't quite work the way you hoped it to, right? Um, the, we hear problems like this all the time. Uh, and like, don't believe the grant reports that say like all of everything went fine. We had like dozens and dozens of people at the activities. Um, in fact, like everyone has an event like this uh, all the time. And we, we sometimes see them underreported. Like when you dig in to talking to people uh, in the Wikimedia movement, they realize like, oh yeah, I run events that were just not very satisfying. They didn't do the results I expected them to do. They didn't actually create any content. Like the newcomers I trained like weren't retained, right? This is a really common experience. You're not alone. That's okay. Uh, we need to talk about these things. We need to learn about them. Um, but the, the, the problems generally fall into a series of patterns that when you talk to more and more organizers, they kind of come along different parts of the pipeline. Um, one of them is that a lot of organizers have like grand aspirations to work on knowledge gaps that matter in the world, right? It could be medicine, it could be climate change, it could be the gender gap, it could be human rights. But they actually have a hard time like finding the right content to edit on Wikimedia projects. And so they run this like very ambitious event on the topic, but the actual edits coming out of the topic aren't very good. And so they have like a kind of a bad experience in that way. The tools to make it easier to find those topics to contribute to are actually kind of hard to use and scattered all over the place. And then when the event is actually run, a lot of first-time organizers who started as editors run events for other Wikipedians like themselves, and they don't realize the public they're doing outreach to needs something else from their event or their program, right? So we, we hear stories of people like, we did a two-hour training about Wikipedia policy, and we ask, well, what, what did your audience think about that? And it's like, they got bored. <laughs> Um, and, and, and that's, that's fine, right? Like this is, that's a good learning experience, right? But that may not be the event you need for that audience. Um, and then, uh, we, we see this kind of pattern, especially if you're a volunteer, you don't have a lot of time to like go and explore the Wikimedia movement. So you only learn how to run the events that are common in your geography, right? So you might've gone to an event yourself or watched someone else run an event in your, your geography, and then you just replicate that, right? And it's like, I'll run this event again, I'll run this event again. And you don't have the time to imagine an alternative model. And so all of these problems are what we're kind of building into the organizer lab, what we designed it to address um, and help people kind of transition. So what, what we did is we created a three and a half month, a little bit longer, a little bit shorter, depending on how focused you are in taking the course. Uh, a course that has five live sessions, six online learning modules to kind of test our assumption that like you, these, this is a system of learning, not just one-off skills you can pick up at conferences. Um, and we kind of designed it in an intense peer-to-peer -peer way where people are constantly showing each other examples of things they've done in their own context. And then we're giving feedback back to the students as instructors. And then last year we ran the first cycle of it in English. And this year we tried to do it in English and Spanish um, because of kind of limits and capacity. But and because those of us who are kind of running it this year all 
spoke Spanish enough to kind of support the course. Um, and we we did this over the course of six units that kind of go through a process of designing a campaign, which is identifying an actual knowledge gap on Wikimedia projects and having kind of a theory of how it will impact the public. Like, oh, okay, there's this gap. I think, you know, readers in Kenya or Tanzania or India need this kind of knowledge for this reason. What content exists on the wikis that people access in my context? And how do I fill that gap? And then really thinking about your audience who will contribute. Um, so the, the challenge that I identified earlier that people run events for Wikimedians, which is great. Like if you wanna run Wikimedia events, a lot of us are volunteers all the time. That's like a great thing to do for community building, but it may not fill that knowledge gap, right? And so you need to identify an audience that can fill that knowledge gap. Right. There's a opportunity to think about it and really design for them. Think about like, OK, if there's activists working on climate change in my context, how do I make sure that both my event and my activity is appealing to them and it actually meets them something in their volunteer lives that makes sense? It's something that they can do in in their relationship to knowledge, to climate activism, to whatever. And then the last part of it is, OK, like, let's look around the Wikimedia movement, see if someone's done something similar to you. And then how do you actually like apply for a grant or design the project so it makes sense to other Wikimedians? Um, so the, the, what do I mean by that first step of identifying a, a knowledge gap? Um, movement strategy has a real tension built into it. Uh, when we say topics for impact. One phrase is like the knowledge that will have impact on the world for like the complicated future we have. And the example that's given is the sustainable development goals, right? So knowledge that we know people need to use to create a future that is like equitable and inclusive and impactful for all, right? And then on the other end of the spectrum in that tension is knowledge that is like most discriminated against the kind of equity uh, circle, like the knowledge that is not documented yet online that is most missing. The challenge we often have in the Wikimedia movement is we go in like all the way in one direction or all the way in the other. The problem with this is you could end up running events that create content that never gets read or used on Wikimedia projects. It sits as a public archive on Wikimedia projects indefinitely, but it, that indefinite archive is not as rewarding for most of our contributors, right? Most people want to think that like the work they're doing is of use to someone else, right? On the other end, if you only focus on the topics for impact, you get in these like super technical areas that only experts can contribute to. Um, an example of this is when I say the word climate change, Sometimes uh, folks are like, oh, I have to talk about climate science. I can only talk about the weather, right? I can only talk about CO2 emissions. And in fact, like those topics require like a PhD and, and like atmospheric chemistry to like find the gap and address it, right? But there's a lot of things in between the, those two extremes that really are useful uh, for, for a lot of uh, uh, the public. For example, we were talking about New Delhi often has air pollution in the winter. Um, like documenting the pollution problems in New Delhi uh, really well and talking about the like local environmental conflict that's involved in that and like potential solutions for it is both a climate solution and a knowledge equity issue, right? Because it, and especially if you're putting it in languages only read or spoken by people in that context, right? Um, you're, it's a very empowering use of this idea of topics for impact, how to work on a knowledge gap. Similarly, when we take time to think about audience uh, for participating in an event, this is an example of a persona that was designed by one of our organizers from Uruguay uh, who took the first round of the course. Um, so in Uruguay, the environmental conflict that keeps happening uh, here is water use problems. Uh, as a country, we're very far ahead on a green economy. 
in terms of like carbon emissions and other things, but water use continuously is a conflict. And so uh, how do you uh, kind of find the people in your context who can contribute to that gap and really be motivating for them? Make sure Wikimedia is a good first activity for them to get in. They have a good first experience with Wikimedia, they understand how to participate and they can build the time into their lives to be motivated and do the thing. And then the last step is that like zooming out. So we use the various resources we have. So I, a couple of years ago, I developed a kind of framework for how campaigns are built in the Wikimedia movement. Um, and so uh, 2019, wow, that was a, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Um, and then uh, we also have the way we present those projects, which is like grant applications, which is a common language we use for presenting those projects, but you could present it in another format. So th these are the kind of steps. This is what the curriculum looks like as we go through. And we chose to look at two topics for impact in the first couple of versions, just so we could manage the cohort and have them talk to each other about the topics they're working on. Uh, so sometimes when you go to like Wikimania, everyone has their pet topic and they talk about it and then no one's actually like talking with them. They're just talking about it to everyone else, right? Uh, and in that gap, that that opportunity to like talk about a topic together, we see it best when there's like cross cross cutting activities, right? Like a campaign. Uh, so the gender gap organizing in particular has been really useful in the community movement because it gets a lot of people talking to each other, right? Um, similarly, like medicine and Wiki for Human Rights. Um, which focuses on environmental issues, they talk to each other. And so we focus on sustainability and gender. This last cycle in the first round, it was just sustainability because we've seen a lot of community forming around these topics, especially in the Global South, where we see the largest kind of challenges and kind of framing projects um, successfully, like emerging communities, right? The ones that have only formed in the last couple of years are newer organizers. Also, these topics are nice because there's more complexity that meets the eye. Um, I, I had that example of the science is where people often start on climate change. Um, on the gender gap, people often start with biographies, but there's so many other gaps around gender that we could be working on that like, if you just get stuck in the biographies, you may not see the other opportunities. And so we're, we're kind of exploring those. Um, so another question for you, uh, like you, you've been thinking about topics for impact, I'm sure. Uh, what topics for impact does your community need activities to fill? Like, have you identified topics where you're like, we, we really need to get better at working on a subtopic that we think will have impact on the public? And I'll use an example while you're typing these in the chat. Um, I'm going to use an example that I think about all the time. So I I recently bought a farm, like a small piece of property here in Uruguay. And like when I look at our content around agriculture on Wikipedia, I am horrified. Uh, <laughs> like I am constantly finding stuff that like is way too scientific or doesn't have any information at all. And the, it's just like the extremes are there. And there are 2 billion people in the world working on the food system. Like if there's there's a public for content anywhere, there's a public on agriculture, right? Um, and so I, I'm constantly kind of wondering like, why don't we have more activities on agriculture and food? This, So are, are you thinking about Mervet? Like, do you, do you want to unmute and kind of explain what you mean by that gap? Uh, yes, thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. So what yeah. I meant is that um, if we specifically talk about the content, uh, I think um, every community has its needs. I mean. 
um, for example, in the Arabic Wikipedia, we usually have gap, a huge gap in the scientific um, areas, for example. But we have mm -hmm. like a, a how, how to say that we are, or there has been a, a focus on filling um, up the gap related to gender, for example, because of the two many campaigns that have uh, been active uh, since years, but uh, usually communities forget about technology. I'm, I'm not talking about the scientific yeah. uh, content or gap, but I mean, uh, because this is a very rapid uh, thing that is really affecting every aspect of life, we really have to take that into consideration whenever uh, a community is designed uh, any campaigns, um, uh, think of the tools, for example, think of uh, the impact of uh, artificial intelligence. So it's not only about the content, even if you are uh, campaigning uh, to, to fill up a gap in the content, you have to take these things into consideration. And I believe that not all communities are capable of doing this. So this is a gap that the foundation has to works toward, I mean, helping um, uh, communities uh, thinking about this, how to accommodate, uh, not accommodate, I mean, how to, uh, yeah, uh, take these things into consideration, especially when there are chances for such discussions um, in, in uh, regional meetups, for example. Uh, so this is something yeah. that uh, that is uh, really important and has to be uh, considered uh, thoroughly. That's my point. Maybe, maybe my answer was a bit uh, shifted from your question, but this really comes up to my mind whenever uh, I uh, um, uh, discuss things related to campaigns and uh, events. I mean, thank you. Yeah, I, I think there's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Like a lot of communities don't have the tools to see the gaps on their wikis, right? They start as editors about things they care about, and then they spend all the time writing about what they care about, and they don't step back and do that analysis and be like, what what, what does the public need right now in the next three years, right? Like that, that's actually a very hard thing to do as a volunteer, so you need tools. Um, uh, yeah, but like as Moni was saying, like freedom fight, uh, like people do human rights defense, right, who are like defending human rights or advocating for communities, um, topics like breaking news, like Zico was talking about, like, right now, I can tell you that artificial intelligence is going to be in the news for the next two years. Like, most wikis should deal with that. The fact that, like, there ought to be some content putting a critical eye on artificial intelligence on your wiki because we know people will read it right um and this is like a strategic move that you may or may not like have the skills for and you may need more community to work on right like you may need someone who like can talk about technology in your local language like uh, i think someone was saying there's a science gap because there's not a lot of literature in kashmiri language maybe you have to build a vocabulary for it, which is actually pretty complicated, right? Uh, and so I, the, we need both like the tools and mechanisms to think about these gaps, but then we also need a process to fill them, right? Um, and this is really challenging. Um, I can proudly say that the first couple rounds of the Organizer Lab seem to be working. Uh, so our initial data suggests that we can actually train people to do this work. It's uh, it's challenging, but it's not too hard. Um, we graduated uh, 21 people in the first round of the lab of the 35 people who applied. And here's some of the graduates uh, celebrating uh, their graduation. Um, and I'll just give you a little bit of statistics. So we could only, because it's an instructor-led course, we could only handle so many participants at one time. And so we had 143 applicants. We accepted 37 in the first round, and we graduated 21. And then we we know about four completed a majority of the content in some way, right? So they worked through it, but they didn't necessarily complete the assignments for any number of reasons. Um, most of the applicants were from uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
including uh, Nigeria, which had about a third of the applicants. And we had a similar ratio in our second round. And then our initial data analysis of kind of grant reports and programs and events, that dashboard activity and that kind of stuff suggests that organizers from the course, their events actually created more edits uh, that were not reverted <laughs> as much as like normal, as the people who applied and didn't get into the course. Um, so we know we're making a difference. Um, we accepted a larger cohort this round because we were, weren't writing the content as we were publishing it. Uh, so we, we uh, were able to accept 55 students and we're gonna have close to between 25 and 30 are gonna graduate. And then we have another five or 10 who create, uh, finished a substantial portion of the content. We also added Spanish this round to see, to test the Wikilearn platform on how the translation works. Uh, it's challenging to run one course in two languages at once. We've learned this is actually very, very hard to do on the platform. Um, and then we added gender uh, in addition to the first one. Um, because we introduced the course as both focused on gender and uh, sustainability, we actually have more diverse content areas that people are working on and they're drifting in different directions between the topics. So we're kind of excited about that. Um, and we're about to graduate them in the next few weeks. They're turning in their final assignments right now. Um, and that gets us back into evaluation. But more importantly, uh, we're confident enough in most of the learning materials that we think we can offer some of it as self-taught content that's paired with workshops at the end. And so we hope for everyone who applied previously or uh, hasn't been able, like is struggling with some part of this, we hope to be able to offer at least some of the learning materials all the time, whenever you need it, to do your own work, uh, which is exciting. Uh, and we can do this with Wikilearn, which is great. Um, so that's what we're exploring. Uh, and that's what the Organizer Lab is. And I wanted to kind of turn it over to the floor for questions. And if you don't have a lot of questions, I can show you some tools that, I, that everyone's excited about from the course. I think we can have, um, there are no questions in the chat box as far as I can see. But so I, I think maybe we'll give others some time to munch on what you have mentioned and come up with questions. And uh, in the meanwhile, I, I think you kind of take the floor yourself. I'd love to see the tools that you have. <laughs> cool. I'll be sure I'll um, be yeah, and I, I, I mean, Moni, uh, do you have any questions before I get into the tools? I'm, I'm really curious. Like, does I, did, did everything I say made sense? <laughs> I had a, a, not exactly a direct question, but it was something that I was hoping to ask you at some point of time. So, we run uh, Afi primarily. Does it? I'm just kind of there. Uh, we run a, a a community a club a wiki club in our university, uh, and it's something that we'd been thinking of. So, abhi we, uh, right now we're primarily working in the English language Wikipedia, but we also want to expand to other languages. And something that you mentioned was uh, when you expanded your course to two languages, there was a lot of uh, there were uh, uh, there were a lot of uh, unexpected challenges so I, I was kind of curious to what they were yeah so i think like running writing contests or running editing activities in multiple languages in the wikimedia movement is not that hard uh if you have experience in both the wikis because we have a lot of things like translation tool all the infrastructure is set up that way but when we step up a level and we're like okay we want the organizers in like English and Spanish that have the same learning experience, you're doing a lot of translation of a lot of different things. 
right? So you're translating like te uh, um, caption files for videos, you're translating learning materials, you're making sure that if you're linking out to a learning material and that out like on Meta or somewhere else, that it's at least like easy to machine translate, right? Um, so there, there's a lot of like learning experience challenges and uh, the Wikilearn platform is designed to help you do that translation, uh, but it's not quite as easy as it is to do it on Wikimedia projects in terms of like the actual translation interface and stuff. Um, and so we, we just ran into some like delays and hiccups because we were trying to have a similar experience as possible in English and Spanish. And we realized that like doing them together requires a lot of logistics, right? Um, so something I, I, I recommend to folks, if you're ever doing a live course uh, during a period of time, you might actually want to offer only one language and then do the next language like six months later, which increased like cost and coordination uh, and all these other things, right? Um, so it, it's, it's kind of a complicated thing with a learning experience at a like across multiple context level in the local context where everyone shares at least one language and you're coordinating like across wikis it's a little bit easier to do um and from a like content campaign perspective the wikimedia movement's pretty good at that um so i i'm i'm like more confident in saying yes run editing events uh like this but like big training <laughs> it's 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 harder um and and there's like a coordination cost involved in that okay brilliant we we will definitely check in with you before we have one of those no. uh, another question which i think uh i think i'm asking this on behalf of a few people in the audience which would be so that's a fantastic course that you have put together uh, mm -hmm. And if for someone who's in the audience or who's watching this later on YouTube or somewhere, they're thinking, should I participate? Should I not participate? Is this for me? Is this not for me? Um, so who is this for, you'd say, the way the course is structured? Um, who would benefit the most from it? And, and what sort yeah. of people so people I think if you dropped out, if you could think of a trend K this person was really excited about it, yeah. but they could not really benefit from the course as such. So um the the to put the dropout rates in context, uh online courses regularly have less than 40% graduation rates in general, uh online. Uh so a 50% or 60% graduation rate is actually pretty high uh for online courses. So I just want to put that in context uh, at kind of like a platform level. Uh, but there, there, we, we've heard a couple of stories from folks. One is just like they didn't anticipate the time required to do this. And I, and I think, you know, as Murda was saying uh, earlier, like kind of thinking through strategy and learning tools to do it is hard, right? Um, and and it takes time. And like we're writing the content to be as accessible as possible, but like there's a lot of new ideas in here if you've only run a few events in the Wikimedia movement, right? You've never done more than run events. Um, and so that's okay. Like if it takes you a long time to learn it or you need to go back to the material. And we've actually heard from some of the people that dropped off that they still went back and looked at the material after the course. And they're like, oh, okay, this is interesting. So that's part one. Um, the course is really for if you run a few events and you're like, I'm part of the Wikimedia movement and I want to have more impact with my activities and I want to run a program that's more strategic, right? So if I, I, I want to go from like the one-off event to like, you know, something that makes sense for an affiliate or if you're paid or you have a role in the Wikimedia movement where you're responsible for planning campaigns and other programs, this would be good for you uh, because the and, and a lot of the people who uh, we encourage to imply are like affiliate staff 
who have responsibilities on topic areas who may not have a lot of experience, uh, that's super extensive. Um, so those are the people that benefit. Uh, we, we plan to publish at least these first four modules as self-taught material. Um, and uh, we, we think any organizer would benefit from these. Um, and then we're going to use a handbooks, the, the idea, and it still hasn't been approved yet for the work, but this is the intention, um, is that at the, each of the, at the end of this group of the first two modules and at the end of the group of the second two modules, you have outputs that you can use for your planning uh, to help you kind of better design activities. And then you share those with us when you apply for a, a workshop that has more direct feedback uh, in these last two units. Um, so that's the idea. Um, we hope to publish these earlier modules sooner rather than later uh, within the next uh, six to 12 months, uh, probably sooner, probably three to six months for some of the content. Um, but that means uh, because we've tested it and we know it works, uh, we've also heard from some of the organi existing organizers that they've used parts of the content in their own training with their own communities. So it's it's pretty well tested, we think. Um, it, it works. Uh, Mervat, you have a question? Um, it's not a question, but I would want to go add more to what you have been uh, answering. Uh, I think of the mm -hmm. uh, uh, things that any organizer can do is to um, to directly discuss with the community what uh, their needs are. So uh, it's good to start by uh, surveying the community, um, uh, checking what uh, people expect, uh, what uh, they are looking for, how they think things should go on. Uh, this is uh, one thing. The uh, other thing is to um, let's say measure or evaluate uh, the impact of the event or the training or the contest or whatever after the fact. And this helps you um, design or uh, uh, decide how to run the next event. Uh, so um, uh, these things are simple tools that anyone can do. And I think it's important always to measure uh, the impact and to measure or, or evaluate the participants. Uh, sometimes uh, you can do like a small contest um, that if, if you were training new newbies, for example, how to edit. Um, so you can ask them to do a few articles and you can see if they learned, if what they learned is effective, they can use it the right way. And uh, uh, this uh, these are tools that help you uh, reshape or redesign your next events uh, better. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I kind of want to endorse that. So if, if you want to repeat the kind of event uh, you're um, kind of doing or the audience you're working with, that's a great idea. One of the things we notice with a lot of grantees is that they don't have a clear audience in mind when they first start applying for grants. And so the first couple of attempts at running events might have access to a community, but it might not be the community that will actually contribute uh, <laughs> to Wikimedia. So they might not be the right audience to begin with. And so we're actually, the course is designed to start at that point. Um, uh, Um, so on the organizer, uh, so uh, there's two questions on the side. One is why why is it a course, not an open resource? Um, we did the course so we could test and evaluate the impact of the content. Um, and so that we could monitor who actually went through the material. So one of the things we've learned, and I wrote a guide many years ago that's in the Programs and Events Dashboard on how to run other phones. I think it's like six or seven years old. We don't have a lot of evidence that people are using it. Uh, like the self-taught materials, unless it's kind of monitored and managed, does not disseminate well in this movement as a general principle. Um, 
that being said, I agree with you. It should be open materials. We want it to be, but we needed to test it and understand if it was the right thing because it is a lot of content. And we didn't want to suggest people like spend a bunch of time on this and then not be sure of the impact. Uh, not, not ourselves understand if the assignments worked, right? So the, in the first round of the course, I think two of the six assignments didn't work very well with students. We, like we learned really quickly. It was like, oh no, actually like this is not helpful <laughs> at all in the, the way we did it. You know, we, we like the students learned, but it wasn't quite the outcome we hoped for. We rewrote three of the six assignments for this round and only one of them is underperforming in terms of like demonstrating the learning we wanted and we think we can fix that with tweaks and so um we we now are comfortable to publish everything as an open tool that you can use in your own context and in the meantime graduates of the course have been using parts of the material uh to do uh things in their own context um Afi, yeah, uh, so you're talking about uh, Wikidata creation uh, on Wikipedia in the classroom. So one of the things we're doing uh, with the course is spending a lot of time on tools. And actually, this is a good time to do tool demos as well. Um, and really focusing people on what we know works for newcomer activities, which is editing existing content. Um, I cannot emphasize enough how the problems most new organizers face around either blocking or disruption with content almost entirely have to do with people trying to create new content instead of expanding existing content um, with new editors, right? And so there's two things we teach uh, in the course that are it, really helping on that. First is distinguishing between the actions that a new contributor will make and an experienced editor will make. Um, a lot of event organizers confuse the two and they give everyone the same training. And then they're like, everyone write a biography <laughs> in this meeting. And that's like, in terms of notability, uh, that's not a very useful activity to do because the people who are writing biographies have like a vested interest in like promoting an individual, a biography, someone they care about. And they don't really have the time to appreciate the sophistication of the notability policy on, on Wikipedia. And we, we've seen this with like art and feminism. They've pivoted all of their trainings away from creating new biographies towards editing existing biographies for this reason, right? Um, so this is just like a general thing we teach is like, okay, start the new editors on editing existing content so that they learn and understand how to work with the thing. And then focus your experienced editors on the knowledge gaps that you know they can work on. Um, and some of this is facilitated by tools. So I'm going to share a tool. Uh, yeah, this is just a recommendation we have to organizers, and we spend a lot of time talking about like what kind of editing action does your audience need to do, right? Um, and we reinforce that over and over. And for the most part, it, it helps. Um, the other thing to do is really understand your topic gap. So um, I was talking about agriculture topic gaps earlier. This is a tool. Um, on that designed by WMF Research called List Building that we've been, we teach in the course, we teach in other places too. So you might've seen this, um, where you enter the language that you're working on in the name of the article, uh, a, a name of an article that's related to the topic you wanna work on. And it's language agnostic and it uses machine learning to identify similar articles based on three characteristics. They have similar words in the articles. They're read in similar reader sessions. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in a second. And they link to similar articles. But it's not just in one Wikipedia. This is across all the Wikipedias. So every Wikipedia is in this data set, which means that I'm not, even though I'm making a recommendation in English, it's based on content in French and Spanish and Italian and, and um, 
uh, Arabic and every other language that we have, right? Swahili. And so what it does is it gives me a pretty good, useful kind of first list of like, you know, whatever number of results I want of similar articles. So if I'm looking at sustainable agriculture, agribusiness, environmental impact of agriculture, permaculture, all of these articles are related to this area, or if they're not related, you can understand why the machine learning suggested they were related. And you, as an organizer, you can say, well, I only need 50 of these for my event. But the thing about this is all of these articles could use editors. They're not in very good shape um, because there's probably a lot of gaps like biodiversity and agriculture. I'm sorry, this article is way too short. <laughs> Uh, that there are all kinds of implications of the impact of agriculture on biodiversity that is not being covered here. And these are the kinds of topics like existing articles, but uh, uh, in that topic area um, is a good place to start. Um, so this is really useful. It's just like, even if you don't know much about the topic, having some suggestions to work on, but also we've been teaching organizers how to think about prioritization of top the content, like what actually needs to be worked on and how. Um, and you can do this with a couple different methodologies. Uh, so you could say, take something from the list building tool and I don't know why it's not generating. Let me make sure I have the right article in there. Sorry, it usually, I've never had a delay quite this long. I'll try a different one real quick. Ah, here we go. Um, so you have these results, you have these 100 articles. You know, if you don't know a lot about sustainable agriculture, it might be challenging. Um, so you can actually save the articles to a page file and then go evaluate them either with PET scan or mass views. Um, so if I run this query on PET scan, you can see the size of the articles and you could say prioritize only the articles that are short and have uh, like an opportunity to be improved, to be added to. Or if I go to mass views, I could go through those articles and be like, okay, the highest visibility articles probably don't want to touch those with newcomers because they're probably, you know, high impact. There's already other editors on it. It's probably really complicated to edit. But this next tier of articles, I could start looking at those and be like, well, if it has over, say, 3,000 page views on English, which is a moderately good amount of page views on English, um, that might be a place to look. Like, let's pick from these 20, the five articles that really matter. Um, yeah, it, it is an important factor, especially if you're going to have new editors coming on to improve the articles. Um, you don't want them editing something that has like 27 page views a month and, yeah, and is not a, like... Uh, so I don't think... Uh, mass views handles uh, featuring good articles, but with PET scan, you could tweak or massage the data. So I could be like, okay, I only want articles bigger than 5,000 bytes, but smaller than 15,000, because I think that's like a medium sized article that has a good structure, but isn't going to be like obscure. Right. And so I have that, that kind of subset of articles from there. So we teach something like this as a way for people to kind of evaluate, uh, like where should I prioritize my work? How do I get people started on topics that already exist? So I don't run into the newcomer problems involved in notability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is this kind of skill where it, it is in the, will be in the self-taught content. Um, we also have, uh, and I talked about reader navigation so for some of the bigger Wikipedias, we can actually tell you the connections between articles based on readers 
uh, like what people are reading. So if I look at um, sustainable agriculture, now this isn't as useful if you're working on a smaller language, Wikipedia. Um, and here, here's the example um, I'm looking at right now. Um, you can see, well, the article on sustainable agriculture, most of, uh, a lot of the traffic comes from search and others. Uh, so I, I'm not, not so interested in that. But the of the readers that come in, they come from the articles, agriculture, environmental impact of agriculture, et cetera. And then they go out to articles like permaculture, sustainable food systems, agroforestry. If one of these pathways to the article don't make a lot of sense to me, um, I have a chance to go change it. I could go work on the lead section of these articles to make sure that the word sustainable agriculture is connected, right? Um, similarly, I could think about like what what topics really should you be thinking about if you are on the sustainable agriculture article and you go in this direction. This is also good if you're planning a translation activity and you're like, I'm on Swahili Wikipedia. I really don't know what articles to prioritize for translation related to sustainable ag. We have one article, but we don't have these others. You could look at some of the bigger languages in your context and, and think about, okay, what kinds of reader pathways do we want to enable on, on Swahili Wikipedia, which doesn't have articles about deforestation, shade-grown coffee, et cetera, et cetera. How do I make sure uh, that these connections work. Uh, Zico, I agree with you. It's not perfect for all the all the Wikipedias, which is part of the reason why the list building tool is a little bit more useful because it gives you other insight uh, into things. And then an important part of the course we teach is actually like evaluating what topics in your your context might matter. So uh, on the agriculture example, both or organizers in both Rwanda and uh, Tanzania, at the end of this cycle, the organizer lab went and looked at it and were like, no, 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 sustainable agriculture matters a lot for us, but we have like a certain subtopic of issues we wanna look at. And so we wanna do agriculture, you know, we wanna do some of these generic global sustainable agriculture topics in our local language. But also, we want to think about what the local topics are that are missing and make sure they're included. So it, it, we're, we're teaching that kind of skill, which is and someone uh, part of the reason I started down this pathway was someone asked, like, why did you teach a course? Um, this is part of the reason why we taught a course, because it takes time to practice and then understand the impact of and see how other people are doing these skills. And sorry, I talked about that very quickly. So I, it might have been. That was, that was spectacular. Absolutely entrancing. <laughs> I mean, I did not even realize that we were like three minutes over time, but that was so beautiful. Uh, wow. Um, I think, uh, I think uh, it's time. We're over time, actually. But thank you so, so much, Alex, for that presentation. I'm sure these tools would come in very handy to the people here. And if any of you, uh, if you'd like to join the new cohort of the course, I think uh, this is, uh, uh, it would be great for you. Anyone else, if uh, if anyone else has any quick comments uh, before we wrap up, Alex, if you have any closing remarks, I think uh, you're more than welcome. Uh, anyone else? And I'm, I'm sure uh, Afi would post the links to these uh, in the event page later for you guys to check out these tools also. And, and we can share my presentation. Um, it's it's okay. usable uh, as part of that. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, we're not sure when we're going to publish the self-taught content, but we're pretty, pretty confident that the two sections that will be self-taught are really valuable for folks um, if they want to get into new topic areas or they want to design for new audiences. Um, and so we're really excited to be able to offer those. And then hopefully we can also pair it with these workshops, which have been really powerful in terms of getting people's designs from like idea to final project that they can actually implement. Um, and so uh, that that is what we're hoping 
to offer. Uh, and I, I'm going to be working on it over the next, I don't know, window of time. So hopefully I see you. If you have questions, if you want some of the material uh, before that we publish it, um, uh, I'm more than happy to help you uh, kind of access some of the stuff. We have ways to give you access without joining the class. Um, but uh, hopefully I can publish it sooner rather than later. With that, uh, I think it's a good time to close. Uh, thank you so much, Alex, and all the best with the Organizer Lab. And we really, I definitely look forward to seeing where it goes. Uh, I'm sure others do mm -hmm. as well. Um, so, yes, thank you everyone for joining. And we'll see you all in the next conversation hour in February.